You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Welcome to this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. As normal, start out with a shout out to uh, our new listeners this week. And this week we have new listeners in London, Cardiff, Portsmouth, Southampton, Birmingham, Reading, Guildford, Swansea and Coventry. And uh, we have new listeners in Spain this week, in Madrid and Barcelona and Bilbao. And we also have new listeners in Italy, in Turin and Milan, in Perth, in Australia. And then over in the USA, uh, a good response to my request last week for you to reach out for new listeners for the show. And so I'm pleased to announce we have new listeners in Maine, in California, in Virginia, in New York, in Washington, D.C., in Texas, in Illinois, New Jersey, Florida, Minnesota, Georgia, and Colorado. So a big warm welcome to you wherever you are listening to us in the world. And of course a big welcome to all of my listeners who now regularly tune in every week for uh, the latest news on GDPR. And I really appreciate you all giving up half an hour of your week to catch up on the latest news as always if you have any comments about the show or any suggestions for things that you'd like to see us cover in the future or perhaps people you'd like us to interview then please uh, drop me a line to podcasts at insurety.co.uk that's e-n-s-u-r-e-t-y dot co.uk podcast at insurety.co.uk or you can find the link uh, on the podcast page of our website at uh, https colon slash slash www.insurity.co.uk And so in just a moment, I'll be telling you what's coming up in this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. Check us out on Facebook. So coming up in this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show... We have uh, a quick update on what I've been up to this week, just to uh, give you some thoughts on things that I've been doing. Uh, then we have a look at a data breach from the Labour Party here in the UK. Then we have a update on a data breach from Airbus. A significant update on the data breach we first brought to you last week from... 500px and that data breach has unfortunately expanded to include other sites so we will uh, give you an update on that um, details of a data breach at a small charity in Peterborough called Family Voice details of uh, not quite a data breach but not fitting in with the rules of data for uh, Nest and their uh, cameras and home security devices and then finally an update on GP's surgeries and some more news which is affecting them concerning data breaches and also a new government initiative on how they think they may be able to help GP surgeries deal with the number of data requests that they're getting and also a small snippet about the police and how they've been using uh, subject access requests wrongly to obtain information from GPs for the issue of firearms certificates. So a real mixed bag in this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. It was a pleasure to spend the first three days of this week training a group of people down in Exeter in Devon. So a shout out to them if any of them are now listening to uh, this podcast. It was great to have such an engaged group of people to train and to bring up to speed on all the latest elements of GDPR and indeed to make sure that they had the skills they needed to go back and be effective uh, data protection officers, DPOs in their own organisations. But I thought I'd use it as a quick plug here to say that 
I had actually delivered that training on behalf of a third party training company and that's something I'm always more than happy to do. So if you, I know a good number of you listening are engaged in the training industry so if you would like um, to be able to offer GDPR training or indeed DPO training as part of your training uh, portfolio but you don't have the skills internally to deliver it then feel free to get in touch with me and I'll be delighted to discuss the opportunities with you. It does obviously broaden the portfolio that you're able to offer your existing clients. I'm quite happy to uh, be white labelled and so appear as a member of your team so that people don't know that I'm from a separate entity and uh, deliver some training and I think the people on the course this week will vouch that it was good fun. We had uh, an entertaining week and also that I'm pleased to report that all of the delegates on the course passed the tests set within the course uh, with flying colours and that's always very rewarding for me as a trainer of course to see people meet their um tests and be able to uh, achieve good results in those tests. So I say it can be a one day course, a half day course. I can provide the training remotely. I can come to your training premises. I can go to the customer's training premises, wherever you want really. Um, so if that would be of interest to you and you'd like to discuss it further, then please do get in touch with me. Uh, drop me an email to podcasts at insurety.co.uk that's uh, e-n-s-u-r-e-t-y dot co.uk podcasts at insurety.co.uk make sure you put the subject line to be um, training request and uh, I'll get back to you just as soon as I can and it'd be great to do some more third party training so please do get in touch if that's of interest to you. Just carrying on from that, um, perhaps as well an indicator of how well now GDPR is becoming known amongst the wider public is uh, I was staying in a hotel down in Exeter, delightful hotel, quick shout out for the innkeeper's lodge. Um, staying in the hotel, anyway got a taxi to the training venue and uh, in the taxi on one of the mornings, I uh, uh, chatting to the taxi driver who said, where are you going? So I told him, what are you doing there? I said, it's a GDPR training course. Oh, he said, with a normal response, where I'm quite used to, because GDPR, let's face it, is not the most interesting subject in the world to the majority of people, probably. But he then said, oh, what, so someone's training you in GDPR? And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm the trainer. At which, to my surprise, he turned the radio off in the car and said, Oh, great. It's going to take us 15 minutes to get there. I've got a couple of questions about GDPR. I'm not quite sure the answers to. Perhaps you can give me the answers whilst we're on the way there. So I ended up giving this taxi driver uh, two pieces of advice, a bit of free consultancy, which it would benefit hindsight. I should have traded for the taxi fare. Um, but a bit of free consultancy on GDPR to the taxi driver. I've got to be honest, that's the first time I've ever had somebody actually question me about GDPR whilst I'm on a journey like that. But it goes to show perhaps the wider reach that GDPR is now getting and as GDPR practitioner myself, of course that really pleases me because part of the message that we're all here for, part of the reason I do this podcast every week, is to get the message about GDPR out there to a wider audience. And so it uh, doesn't matter whether you're managing director of a great big blue chip company or your local taxi driver in Exeter, I'm always quite ha happy to help you find the answers to your GDPR questions. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. It's been a topsy-turvy world in British politics this week with the... Uh, departure from both Labour and Conservatives to a new political group calling itself the Independent Group. Uh, it's currently made up of uh, seven, or indeed now eight, um, Labour 
or ex-Labour MPs and three ex-Conservative MPs. However, the formation of a new group within Parliament was bound to create a few ripples as far as GDPR was concerned, but Labour um, managed to effectively shoot themselves in the foot because they took the step on Tuesday evening of reporting their former MP, Joan Ryan, who's now left to join the independent group, um, reporting Joan Ryan to the Information Commissioner's Office alleging that she had carried out a data breach by contacting members after resigning from the Labour Party. Of course, the issue here is that the Labour Party themselves are the data controller and therefore ultimately any responsibility for a data breach lies with them and not with the individual who may have carried out the data breach. That's a whole different issue, but it's not to do with GDPR. Um, anyway, as a result of the breach, um, Labour took the decision to shut down two of their major uh, pieces of software which they use. One called Contact Creator, which they use to identify specific people in the constituency so that candidates can target them with messages and another internal piece of software called Organise. Um, the party's general secretary, Jenny Formby, said that data held by the party, including data within Contact Creator and other systems used for election or other campaigning work, may only be accessed by individuals who are authorised to access it and may be used only for the purposes authorised by the Labour Party as the data controller. Much of the data held on our systems tends to reveal individuals' political opinions and is therefore a special trafficking data benefiting from enhanced protection under the legislation. Um, we tried to contact the Labour Party without success, but we did get a comment from Joan Ryan herself who said that she had no idea what Jenny Formby was talking about. Um, neither her or her or her office had access or used any Labour Party data since Ms Ryan resigned the Labour Party whip and, as, and subsequently her membership of the Labour Party. So my feel is that I don't think this is actually serious enough data breach that needed to be reported to the ICO anyway. Although it involves sensitive data, the volume is likely to be reasonably small. And so I think it's possibly a bit of a knee-jerk reaction on behalf of the Labour Party. But nonetheless, uh, my understanding from contacts within the Labour Party is that both pieces of software are now back in use, but the users have had to reset their passwords. Um, so, easy to see how data that is affected by GDPR can become a major issue, but also highlights perhaps the need to stop and think before actually deciding whether a breach is serious enough to report it to the Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. European Airspace uh, Corporation Airbus disclosed details of a data breach this week. Uh, the data breach actually happened back towards the end of January but they've only just released details into the public domain and um, they say that some personal data was accessed but it was mostly professional contact and IT identification details of some Airbus employees in Europe. The aircraft manufacturer say that they are currently investigating to understand quite how the uh, intruders got in to the system and indeed how or what data may have been taken. Uh, the company was also keen to stress that they've made the necessary contact with the regulators in the countries involved, and they don't anticipate it being a serious data breach. They've also notified all the employees whose data may have been uh, stolen. And uh, so it's good to see a major company like Airbus handling the data breach in a controlled and sensible way, which, of course, is something we always advocate. Check us out on Facebook. 
Just a reminder that as well as the podcast, we now have our own Facebook group. Please do pop along and see us there at https colon slash slash www.facebook.com slash groups slash GDPR weekly show. That's always one word, GDPR weekly show. And uh, do please come and join the group and follow the discussions that are going on. You're listening to the GDPR weekly show with your host, Keith Budden. Regular listeners to the GDPR Weekly Show will remember me mentioning a data breach at photo sharing site 500px. Um, It now appears that that breach was wider than we originally anticipated in that it's not only involved the site 500px but also a number of other photo related sites including IM, EYEM and also Animoto, uh, Artsy, which is believed to be how the data breach may have affected up to 1 million users, and Photolog, where it's believed the data breach may have affected the accounts of up to 16 million users. The massive attack appears to have been common across all of these sites, and so it's thought that the hacker has been uh, either the same person or certainly one of a similar group of people. And the good news is is that the only data taken has been the usernames, the email addresses and the passwords. But the passwords in, in certainly the case of IM, and we believe in the case of the other sites, have been encrypted using uh, a good encryption method, but also incorporating a a salt key um, which makes the passwords much more difficult to hack and unencrypt and so it's unlikely that any password data has actually been lost but of course as always uh, we would recommend that if you use IM Animoto 500px uh, or indeed uh, Artsy or Photolog that at the earliest opportunity you now go to that site and change your password and we would recommend obviously as well that you change the password on any other sites or services where you may have used the same password which you previously used on one of those affected sites. We will bring you any any further updates in future episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show if and when we hear more about this particular data breach or indeed if it looks in the following week as if the breach has expanded to include any other uh, sites or online services. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host Keith Budden. Peterborough charity Family Voice Peterborough um, suffered a data breach which reported itself to the ICO for this week. What happened, as far as we can understand, is that Family Voice Peterborough conducted a survey on behalf of Peterborough City Council to help it recommission its short breaks offering, which are day-based opportunities for children and young people with disabilities. However, due to a uh, what appears to have just been a manual error by uh, Family Voice Peterborough, the data was breached onto the charity's Facebook page, including contact details of parents who took part in the survey. Children's disabilities were also revealed, although not the names of the children, and Family Voice insisted it would not have been possible to identify which disability a named child had from the published information. Given that it's medical information, which is uh, obviously sensitive data as far as GDPR is concerned. The Information and Commissioner's Office acted on this very quickly, um, but a spokesman for the ICO said that it was now satisfied with the charity's remedial action and did not feel that any further action was required. So, good to see a charity being responsible because of the uh, sensitive data involved being responsible for reporting itself to the ICO and the ICO indeed uh, acting quickly to provide reassurance both to the charity and of course the parents of the children involved 
that there was no serious data breach and that the ICO was satisfied with the actions taken. So a good result all round, I think. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. If you can't have a week without a UK news programme mentioning Brexit these days, neither can you have an episode of the GDPR Weekly Show which doesn't mention either Google or Facebook. And this week it's the turn of Google or rather not Google directly, but another company within the uh, Alphabet Group, the overall arching group which owns Google. And in this case, it's Nest. Um, Some of you may already know that Nest has a range of video doorbells, security cameras and thermostats that automatically adjust settings based on user behaviour. All good so far. However, What Google didn't tell people was that the Nest Secure Home Security System had a built-in microphone and was actually listening to uh, what people were saying and potentially, of course, having the opportunity to record that data without people within the property being guarded knowing that that was happening. Google have now taken steps to correct this problem and are checking back to see how many uh, units may have been affected and will be contacting those customers accordingly. Um, so, a relatively minor thing for Google, all this really probably in the overall scheme of things, bear in mind that they're still fighting their 50 million euro fine levied by the French State of Protection Authority, uh, CNIL, back in January, um, but yet another thing which has affected them with regard to GDPR. Uh, a spokesman for Google said they treated GDPR very seriously, that they had a great number of staff working on GDPR, GDPR compliance, and they tried to take what they believed was a conservative view because they wanted to make sure they were managing risk appropriately. Uh, so we'll wait and see whether there be any update on this Nest uh, data breach or whether the ICO will be satisfied that the matter's now been dealt with. In common with many of these items, um, this is being dealt with by the Irish ICO as that is where Nest have registered for the purposes of GDPR. And as I say, whenever we get an update on this, In the coming weeks, we'll bring it to you in a future episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. 3,300 GP practices across the UK uh, may have breached the Data Protection Act and GDPR indeed. Uh, due to a new childhood vaccination data system. The British Medical Association has warned around 3,300 GP practices that the new extraction system, which is used to share data with the Child Health Information Service, may be in breach of GDPR. It said the situation is currently being clarified. The concerns are not a data breach per se, but around the principle of data minimization, which requires that systems should hold a minimum amount of personal information needed to fulfill the purpose for which the system is in place, uh, but no more. And hopefully any of you are using data on the day-to-day basis are aware of that aspect of GDPR. Nonetheless, the BMA has warned GPs that they should not sign up to any new uh, child health information service extraction system until the issue has been resolved. The government has provided some good news to GPs' practices this week, though. Uh, You may remember a few weeks ago we were talking about the issue that GPs were facing in providing uh, personal health information to patients 
and the time this was taking and also just checking what was what should be sent what shouldn't be sent and particularly with regard to insurance claims etc and the government announced that as part of their new five-year GP contract practices will have access to a data protection officer DPO through their clinical commissioning group their local body which oversees the provision of NHS services in order to monitor compliance to data protection law and to act as a point of contact for patients requesting access to their data. Now, I'm not quite sure how this is going to work because on the face of it, what they seem to be saying is that patients now making a subject access request rather than sending it to a GP will send it to their data protection officer at their relevant clinical commissioning group, CCG. I suspect this may create a bit of a paperwork round robin, to be honest, because most people, I'm fairly certain, are still doing the right to their GP surgery. And presumably then, the GP surgery is going to pass the request on to the DPO at the clinical commissioning group, who's then going to have to come back to the surgery to find out what data is being held on that particular patient. It's then going to decide what data should be released, is then going to instruct the surgery what data to release, and then ultimately get back to the person making the request, and bear in mind that all this has to be done in just 30 days. I can sympathise with the logic behind what the government is doing here. Personally though, I'm not convinced it's the best way of solving the problem, I think, yeah, still don't have the problem here of trying to jam a square peg into a round hole. Um, but we shall see. And uh, again, doubtless this will continue to come up in future episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show, so we will, of course, keep you updated. The government's allocated £20 million to this, so they're obviously taking it reasonably seriously. Uh, but I think there are two issues. I say one, I think it's been created around Robin. B, where are they going to find all these staff who are trained as DPOs to be able to do the work for the clinical commissioning group around the country? Perhaps there's an opportunity there for them to employ a trainer, hint, hint. Um, the other issue that's happened is that the police may be breaching GDPR which is a bit of an irony, really, because the police have been submitting subject access requests to GP practices to establish whether patients are medically safe to hold a firearms licence. And the ICO has now got involved in this because the ICO is not at all satisfied that this is how things should be happening. And indeed, the ICO has issued some advice which has said that the ICO is aware that access to medical records to personal firearms licensing has raised concerns given the more stringent provisions of the new data protection regime. But it's our view that, this is the ICO's view, that the police have adequate powers and authority to deal with this as they've done to hitherto, namely by approaching the GP direct for the information they require. This would permit the GP to provide only information which in their professional judgment was pertinent to the application rather than course, all the data which is having to be released under a uh, subject access request. This would not constitute consent in data protection terms, and but they're satisfied that because of the legal obligation upon the police to provide, obviously, the safe operation of the firearms licence uh, method, methodology, um, that that's fine, to release the data, but only the data which the police need to make the decision on the firearms licence and not all of the data about the subject which would have been the case released under a subject access request. So, a bit interesting when the uh, one part of the government actually slaps down the police for not applying the law correctly. So, just a little note to... Uh, end this episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. 
So that brings us to the end of this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. I hope you found it useful. I hope you found it entertaining. Please do let me know. Let me have your feedback by sending an email to podcast.insurity.co.uk. You can find out more about us at Insurity at www.insurity.co.uk. And I look forward to speaking to you again, same time, same place, next week. Have a good week, everybody, and remember to keep your data safe. Check us out on Facebook. The GDPR Weekly Show is an Insurity production. Follow us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash insurity.